and welcome to another episode of The Mushroom Show. I am super excited because today we are talking to Mike Tyson. No, not the boxer, although this interview is gonna be just as hard hitting. We are talking to the mushroom Mike Tyson, of course, super huge personality on Instagram who's teaching you how to grow mushrooms. He's also selling mushroom grow kits. He's a great educator in the space, but he's also gotten into some really cool things around mycophilanthropy, which is helping people on the other side of the world grow mushrooms and start mushroom farms. We talk about all sorts of things from Mike Tyson running his own mushroom business to the specific reasons why he chose a lion's mane as his main area of focus. We also talk a lot about his medicinal mushroom company, Herisium Labs, and the amazing things that he's doing with lion's mane in that capacity. So I think you're gonna love this interview. Of course, there is links in the description if you wanna jump to any point in the interview, and I also encourage you to check out some of the links to learn more about him, which are in the description of this video. So let's jump right into it, Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson, thank you so much for joining us on The Mushroom Show. Tony, thanks for having me, man. It's a pleasure to be here. We've had a long-term relationship. You know, I think both of us uh, got in the mushroom space around the same time. And, uh, you know, that one time, though, that I saw you with your beard when you were, like, a wild man like me, I was like, man, like, I wish Tony would go back to that, that state right there. I never saw you like that. So I felt like I saw you in your pure form in, in, in that moment. Yeah, so uh, real quick, I, I did have a, a, a massive beard at one point. I went an entire year without without shaving because I did the, I don't know if I told you this, but I did the Pacific Crest Trail, which is this hike from Mexico to Canada. Oh, wow. And the whole thing is you don't you don't shave when you're on the trail. Yeah, of course. But that took five months. And then for the, the additional seven months, I thought, what the hell, I'll go for it. I'll go for a year. And, Got pretty big. Yeah, but, uh, I had to trim her back. I couldn't handle it. Um, uh, but I like I like the beard on you, man. It's it, it look it's a good look on you. I'm, I I want to shave it. Honestly, I'm so sick of it at this point. And my backstory is I was in the army. They made me shave every day. And uh, I just like after I got out, I was like I'm never shaving again. And now I'm like ah, I don't like it. But my daughter, she's like, no, Papa, I love your beard. It's beautiful. She says. And I'm like ah, you know, like. And I ask her every day. I'm like, hey, can I shave this thing in? She's like, no, Papa, it's beautiful. Because I think she'll freak out if I don't have my beard. Because she's only known me with a beard. And so you know, when, when that's that, that's that's my that's what's holding me back. But eventually, you'll see me with a a, a well maintained beard. You know, because I just let mine go wild. I don't. That's so funny that you mentioned that because when I was a kid, my dad did that same thing where he had a giant beard and then he shaved it one day and I didn't recognize yeah. it. As a kid, I freaked out. Right? Yeah. I was like, who is this guy? <laughs> yeah, no, I've heard tons of stories of the same thing and I don't want to traumatize her. You know, if, if, if I'm doing it, I want her to be part of the shaving process, right? Like that way she's totally <laughs> mentally locked in. There's no surprises and she gets it. But the wife's always yelling at me too. She's like, I miss your face. I'm like, yeah, I, I, I don't even remember what it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> you got You got to make it seem like it's. It, you know, it was their idea to make you shave it, and then, uh, and then, then it should all be good. Um, that's awesome. More, more bearded people in mushrooms. Actually, I think it's a pretty common thing to have a lot of bearded, bearded dudes in mushrooms. I don't know why. I think it goes hand in hand. Uh, yeah, for you, whatever you, you just get a little bit more wild when you explore the mushroom world. And uh, you know, for me, uh, like the big issue is, is always people asking me about the lab. They're like, "How do you have the beard in, in the lab? Like, how does that work?" And I'm like, "It's never." never not worked. So I don't know. I don't know what to tell you, you know, from the stiller box days all the way up to like the, the clean room now that we have. Um, I haven't had any issues that I could point to my beard and be like, Oh, man, it's the beard's fault. You know, <laughs> so I, I don't think it matters, you know, and, and uh, I guess as long as you're using your equipment, right, it, it doesn't matter. We'll put it that way. The mushrooms know how to respect the beard. I think that's <laughs> but <laughs> What, what I would want to know is because like, okay, of course, mushrooms, it's, it seems like a niche topic, right? And uh, maybe not so much anymore, but when, when, you know, when you got back in, into it, it was definitely a niche topic. How did you get interested in mushrooms? Like, where did that come from? Where did Mike Tyson's interest in mushrooms come from? So the long and short story is I, I was in the military. I was in Baghdad for 16, 17 months. Uh, I came back and, and I was a little messed up in the head like a lot of the veterans are. And uh, honestly, I was in a really bad place. I was depressed. Uh, I was on drugs and suicidal. Like I was, I was in a really bad place. So eventually this guy that I was getting my stuff from hands me a bag of psilocybin mushrooms from whatever. And at the time I didn't know or care or hadn't tried or experimented with them. Came back with like a whole new understanding. Like I just got out of the shower, you know, kind of feeling where I was like, wow, I'm a whole new person. And uh, I came back with just a lot more love and and passion, you know, all of the stereotypical cliche things that people say about mushroom trips, you know, those were what I was, you know, I became this, this, this part of this one single organism that is humanity. And, uh, you know, it, it really, it, it humbled me, but it also showed me that I could take natural plant medicine a little bit more seriously. Um, because up until that point in time, it was just, uh, you know, I called it hippie technology. Cause I'm like, yeah, there's hippies go hug the trees with their, their <laughs> pot and their, 
and their tinctures and stuff. And now, you know, 10 years later, uh, 11 years later, I, I'm like a living, breathing success story for plant medicine in general. And, and, you know, a lot of people have the misconception that I'm like constantly tripping all the time. And I'm like, I'm not <laughs> like I had my time. I did it. And, and, and it opened the door to gourmet and medicinal mushrooms for me. I think a lot of people uh, ultimately, you know, get into this space who, who find themselves doing things with the gourmet and medicinal side have opened that door thanks to psychedelic mushrooms. So that's really how I got into it. And it's funny cause I was, uh, I'm a second generation mushroom grower. Like my dad, he's been a, uh, an agaricus farmer for 35, 40 years now. And I grew up in the button mushroom farms, like in the doubles. I'm sure you've seen the, the doubles. You've probably been yep. inside some doubles yeah. before. And uh, so I grew up in those things and I hated mushrooms growing up. And like, I was just like, no, nah, I can't imagine myself ever doing this. And now here I am. It's my life. It's a little different flavor than the button mushrooms, but uh, you know, it's, it's an ironic twist to my, to my story for sure. Yeah. Well, I, but you did work in the agaricus uh, farming for I did. quite a while, right? Yeah. 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 So, uh, what happened was like, what started all of this, what started by Tyson was I was working for the state department of public welfare, uh, which rebranded to like the health uh, and human services department. But uh, I was working there. They were, I was really well paid. I was doing it work, uh, you know, doing network security and stuff like that. But my boss literally yelled at me for working. He was like, you can't work. You, you, you gotta wait until I tell you to do something. I'm like, well, so what am I supposed to do? He's like, well, bring in a magazine or a laptop or something. And I was like, okay, that's fine. I'm bringing the laptop. So I brought in a laptop. I started our mushroom growers because I was having a hard time finding a nice safe space for people to talk about new ideas and for newbies to, to kind of converse with each other without being destroyed by the people who've been doing it for a decade, you know, like on the Shroomery and some of the other forums yep. where like there's these people just have this like chip on their shoulder and like, yeah, you don't, you don't know what you're doing. Why are you asking questions? And like, I don't know, that attitude was like, okay, but we're all new here. We're all trying to learn and you're going to attack us for learning. So I wanted this, this space to talk about mushrooms uh, in a different way. And uh, that's where mushroom growers came from. And I was sitting there trying to figure out my username and I was like, oh, let's take a bite out of mycology. And then that's all, that's all she wrote. That's where Mike Tyson mushrooms came from. Oh, uh, and so like what? Taking a bite out of mycology. I just, that just clued in for me. I never thought about that before. <laughs> yeah. And he's got a woodier mushroom in his mouth too. Yep. Uh, in the logo, which is awesome. Some generous random stranger on, on uh, Reddit illustrated my username one day. And uh, just posted it in a comment. You know how that happens on Reddit, yep. like where people just draw stuff up and they're like, "Hey, like this is my parody account or whatever." And I was like, well, "I liked it so much. I was like, I need to commission more of these." And and uh, you know, one of them was absolutely with the the woodier mushroom in its mouth. So next time you see the logo, you'll see it. it. No, that's that's hilarious. Now, and there's so many things to dig into uh, there. But it's funny because you talked about Reddit, uh, our mushroom growers, which for the people listening is a subreddit. And I think you started that in 2015. Is that correct? Yeah, that sounds right. Um, and now we're at like 225,000 subscribers, which is crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. And it just went parabolic. Like I was looking at some of the stats and, you know, it was right around when, you know, some of the lockdowns really started. It was growing a lot before then. But when the lockdown started, I'd say like whatever, March 2020 and April 2020, the whole thing just went parabolic. And I think everybody was like, oh, like, you know, stuck at home. What are we going to do? Yep. Let's start growing mushrooms. And, and you're right. Like the only thing that really existed before uh, our mushroom growers was the shroomery, which is, you know, obviously great. I mean, yeah. like a lot of people have benefited massively from the shroomery since 1997. Like that's where I went in the early days, but Same like here. it was very focused on psilocybin. Um, and you're right. There was like, uh, there was some, some attitude on that. Form. You know, <laughs> it wasn't the friendliest place. Yeah, to exactly. Be. Um, so, so you created r slash mushroom growers on Reddit as a place for people to kind of go learn and communicate. And I remember I was there in the early days when you started that subreddit. And, uh, I, and I remember the post that you posted about quitting IT. And I think it was somewhere along the lines of like, fuck it, I'm doing it. Like, yeah. I'm going fully into mushrooms. Uh, so tell us a little bit about that. Like, again, what was the impetus behind saying, okay, you know, I'm, I'm doing IT, this is fine, but like, I'm, I'm actually interested in mushrooms and I want to do something with this. So it was soul sucking really, to be honest, like just existing at a desk for, I was making like 30, 35 bucks an hour, which sounds great to most people. Oh, I don't have to work and I can make all that money. But like driving an hour to the, to the state capitol and then signing in just to sign in and then existing, like I could literally leave my desk and go walk around the city of Harrisburg. As long as I clocked in, my boss didn't care about me. And for me, that was like, I made it nine months before I was like, I can't do this. I, I really can't do this. This is the, the most like IT work in general. If you're good at it, you don't really work a lot anyway. Right. But like, this was literally no work. This was literally no work. And I had my camera. 
Uh, I would bring my camera out. I would go take pictures of mushrooms. I found my first wild lion's mane, you know, while I was on the clock, which was dumb. And like, yeah. just circle back a little bit. I asked everybody else, like in my in my in my area that I worked with, I was like, what do you guys do? And they're like, nothing. We just hang out. I'm like, oh my god. So it's not just me, right? It's like everybody. Um, but so for me, that's that was like the the the, the turning point. Um, you know, I did a little bit of work. I decided from that moment that like when I quit that job, that I just wanted to work from home so I could work on building and growing mushrooms. Uh, and, and a mushroom business. And at the time I was selling uh, cultures under the brand Get Cultured Today. Um, it was just Get Cultured, um, but like I had to buy Get Cultured Today as a domain. And like that was my first uh, dip into the water. So anybody who gets into cultivating gourmet mushrooms or even psilocybin mushrooms understands that once you get one culture, you're not gonna stop. It, it just keeps on coming. And, and you, you people, especially in the gourmet space, they're happy to send you their whole culture bank. Like I swapped culture banks with a couple people um, where, where I started with, you know, one or two cultures and then all of a sudden I had like 50 yep. and it's like, Oh, you get that Pokemon syndrome where you got to catch them all. Right. Yep. And so I started you know selling those and, uh, then that transitioned into experimenting with growing, uh, shiitake. And then from shiitake, it was lion's mane and reishi. And I found out that I had a really good handle on growing lion's mane. Really, I was just using more spawn than most other people, but a lot of people were struggling with lion's mane because it's a slower growing mushroom. It takes you know two to three weeks and for for a typical grower to colonize their substrate and uh, and get to the point where they're ready to grow it. And when I found out that I had this like this knack for making beautiful lion's mane substrates, I was like, oh, I'm gonna start selling these. Um, and so we. We were doing some fresh fruit sales at the markets locally, um, and, and it was at the time that I uh, – it was Christmas time, and I was selling, like, mushroom growing kits to the average people who were, who were around here. They weren't mushroom growers by any means. But when I realized that those people could grow mushrooms just as well as I could with just a little bit of guidance uh, and, and having a fully colonized substrate, I was like, I just need to get into this space but online. And uh, it was around that time that my daughter or uh, that my wife got pregnant with my daughter. And so I was like, all right, you know, the markets are cool and we're having a lot of fun here. But um, let's let's really let's let's scale this up and let's go online and, and take everything there and go full online. And that's really where like Mike Tyson mushrooms dot com uh, came in uh, because it's it's that was like the, the pivotal moment for me. And I never intended for Mike Tyson to be this big mushroom brand. Right. Mm -hmm. Like it was just my username on Reddit. I needed an outlet. But, uh, you know, here we are. And, and now, you know, I've, I've pivoted from the gourmet mushroom supplies. You know, I've poured more Petri dishes than most people uh, in their life ever will. <laughs> and like that was like my main uh, outside of Lion's Mane. That was my main thing. But now we're pivoting into the Lion's Mane extract space because Lion's Mane was really the extract that I started taking after my experience with psychedelic mushrooms. When I first got out of the military, that was like. And it, and it changed the way that I think about mushrooms and, and the supplements. Um, I've been taking lion's mane supplement for the last decade. And, uh, you know, it's cool to be making my own now. And I don't really have interest in other supplements, but the lion's mane extract is something that I have close to my heart that I feel has directly impacted my life in a positive way. And uh, it's where I get all my energy from. So, like, it's, it's cool to be making my own at this point. And that was only a decision that we started, uh, that we considered after COVID happened. Um, the brand that I was taking for five or six years, they changed the formula due to some supply chain interruption. Mm -hmm. And uh, I called them and asked, because I was like, why doesn't this work anymore? What's going on? My medicine, I, I need it. Like, I need my mushrooms <laughs> to work, man. And uh, they were like, oh, sorry, COVID. You know, you get the, the same spiel from almost anybody you call now that has a problem. It's like, oh, it's COVID. Uh, but, uh, that was like the, the turning point for us. It was like, okay, uh, I guess it's time to, to really start making our own. And, um, that's like the most exciting thing for me because that's really where I've always wanted to be, uh, deep down in my heart, but I didn't have the, the market or the understanding, you know, I'm sure you've read probably more research papers than I have, um, on this stuff and trying to digest that stuff is like the first time you glance over a research paper, your eyes probably glaze over and you're like, uh, I don't know. Right. what they're talking about here and then after language. you do it for a few years you can you can digest it a little bit yeah but uh you know i, I didn't quite feel confident and i didn't really have a need because i was comfortable but they sort of forced me to to do that and so you know that's where our future is 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 just the lion's mane supplements and uh i think i'll uh you know eventually phase out mike tyson as a brand and just really focus on the lion's mane supplements because that's really what pumps me up about mushrooms the most you know there's a lot of potential you know like the tapestry behind me is from Josephine and Uganda. Um, and like the fact that they can grow oyster mushrooms in Uganda is like crazy cool. And we can talk about that. Um, but like 
there are so many, like we were talking about earlier, there's so many different ways to get excited about mushrooms. Um, but for me, the, the most exciting is the supplements. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree with you. There's so much, and it's funny the paths that we take, right? So you started this, uh, you started the subreddit, which you probably didn't expect to take off like it did. Uh, you kind of built a brand, even though you didn't really intend to build a brand around Mike Tyson, you got into lion's mane just because, you know, that's something that people want to learn. And then now with Heresium labs, you're actually selling lion's mane supplements. So it's kind of this, you know, it, it makes perfect sense in hindsight, but at the time, I guess you, you probably never would have predicted, you know, where you're going to go or where you're going to take this, which I think is always cool. You know, we've experienced the same thing, but that's the thing about mushrooms. You know, it connects a lot of people and it makes a lot of different, you know, you can go so many different angles with it. Um, but you talked about, so I was going to dig into this later, but we might as well now because we're, we're talking about it. So Heresium Labs is the supplement uh, that you started. Mm -hmm. And so that is just lion's mane. It's yep. an extract of, of lion's mane. And again, that's something that you've had lots of personal experiences with and, and benefiting from. So what specifically is it about lion's mane that you think makes it such a powerful and effective supplement? So for me, you know, like growing up, I was on Adderall and Ritalin and all that stuff. And uh, especially post uh, military, I smoked a lot of pot. And so uh, for me, the, the lion's mane really helped me to balance out my, my energy levels and to, to keep me focused and attentive and energized mentally while also, you know, negating the side effects or, or side effects of the pot, you know, because I smoked a lot of pot, all right, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> but um, I really felt like that helped me navigate through the space and still, you know, crush all the, the work that I had to do while also maintaining uh, some semblance of uh, clarity and focus, right? And and so for me, it's, it's the mental energy. I joke to people, like when I first started taking Lion's Mane supplements, I tried the first one was Host Defense from mm -hmm. Paul Stamets. And, um, you know, he's the guy that I watched his TED Talks on Mushrooms Can Save the World and it got me all fired up. And then I found myself paging through a Paul Stamets magazine, uh, Fungi Perfecti. And um, uh, on the last page, there was a cross-reference chart that had all the benefits of the mushrooms, uh, the various medicinal mushrooms. And the one that stood out to me the most immediately was uh, lion's mane because it said nerve tonic. Um, and I was like, Oh, cool. At the time I was trying to find nootropics to help with my brain because of the, the stress from Iraq. And, uh, I, I immediately went to Wikipedia, started researching and learning about it. And I was like, I need to try this. Well, when I tried his, I was like, this, I don't, I don't know what's going on. And like, not to, to talk poorly on the guy, the guy got a lot of people excited about mushrooms. He's doing really awesome things, mm -hmm. but like his stuff didn't work. Mm -hmm. And I was like, all right, I'm not, not discouraged. Let me try another brand. So I tried another brand. And when I tried that, I, I felt like the guy from Limitless, the movie where the guy takes the pill and all of a sudden his brain starts working on overdrive and it's like, you're connecting dots you didn't even see. Uh, and, and so for me, like, I was like, wow, this is really powerful. And uh, it, it really inspired me to, to uh, dig into the medicinal mushrooms and, and their benefits. And mm -hmm. the other one that caught my attention was, was of course, reishi, mm -hmm. because it's basically everything. It's, you know, from uh, anti-yeast to antibacterial to anti-tumor um, and everything in between. The only thing it didn't have was sexual potentiator <laughs> checked. And I was like, ah, I mean, that's okay. But as an American, I was looking for uh, sort of like an anti-American vitamin, right? Like, like, uh, cause like our lifestyle is just terrible in terms of like health overall. Mm -hmm. And so for me, uh, I started taking reishi supplements at the same time I started taking lion's mane supplements because I was like, well, I'm American. We have all these things working against us. Uh, let's, let's, let's dig into that a little bit more. And, uh, but the, the most exciting thing about lion's mane for me is that it's got a palpable effect. You know, you, you consume this, uh, I like the tincture better than I like capsules just because it hits you right away. But um, it, it's one of the few that has a direct physiological response. And I've tried cordyceps. Everybody's on the cordyceps train. But for me, cordyceps doesn't do anything. It literally doesn't. I've tried fruit bodies. I've tried teas. I've tried extracts. I've tried everything. And people are like, it's a different buzz, man. And I'm like, I've, I've drank like way more than I should as far as the extracts go. And I still didn't get anything. Um, so for me, I, I don't know if I'm just immune or if I'm trying to feel something like the lion's mane up here when it's really in the body. I'm not sure, but the, that's why Lion's Mane gets me so excited is because of all of the energy and the ability to focus. Uh, and, and really, like I said, it, it helped to combat uh, a lot of the things I was working against just physiologically with myself and, and having ADD or ADHD mm -hmm. or whichever doctor I, I wanted to go to called it. Uh, but also, you know, because I smoked a lot of pot, it, it really did help to negate the, the side effects of the pot, you know, and I, I still had the motivation to, to do all this that I'm, that I'm doing now and, and then some. 
Um, yep. So for me, it's it's really that men- mental energy and and like it just puts me in beast mode, man. I love it. Well, I can definitely tell. I mean, you're definitely fired up, and uh, you know, mushroom growing and running a business like you're doing takes a lot of physical and mental energy. And I think uh, I, I don't think people realize how how hard it is to actually do that. I mean, mushroom growing is like babysitting on a massive scale, or running a business is kind of the same. So you definitely need that. Uh, you definitely need that energy. And it's funny you mentioned cordyceps doesn't work, but for you, anyways. And I think. What this comes back to is how like complicated we are physiologically and it's gonna you know nobody's really got it figured out right there's different extracts there's different parts of the mushroom there's different ways it interacts with their body like it might be you know you have something slightly different in your physiology where somebody else who takes cordyceps has a huge beneficial effect so um it really is unique to the person you found lion's mane works really good for you i think that's awesome i use lion's mane too like i used to get a lot of uh, concussion problems and lion's mane was one of the things that really helped with that and you know you start looking to the research and you figure out okay that's why that actually makes a lot of sense that it would do that um you know similar to reishi reishi is a super powerful mushroom i don't know if you know this but like one of the first reishi cultures i ever got I actually got from you on a trade <laughs> that we did on mushroom growers and I still have that culture. Like I still grow it out all the time. That's crazy. Um, whatever, seven <laughs> years later. So, <laughs> yeah, I remember it was so cool because you sent it to me in like this little, uh, this little tiny cap. Little cryo exactly tubes, yeah. It. Exactly. And I thought that was such a neat way to ship uh, cultures because usually you get them on the petri dish. Sure. And, I don't know. There's all sorts of problems, and you just sent this like tiny little cap. I was like, oh, what is this thing? Like this is not going to work. And of course, I grew it on a plate, and it worked awesome. Yeah. So, uh, man, you're taking me back though. I haven't used those cryotubes in a long time, like since probably seven years ago or so. Um, but that's, that was like my, I don't know, it's cheap and foolproof. You can't break it. You can't squish it. You can't do anything bad to it. And, uh, you know, I got cultures internationally from people in those little things and, and like people sent me from Poland that were in the mail for two or three weeks and they worked fine. Uh, so, you know, it's, uh, it was a clever solution. And of course you kept shipping low, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You sent it to me a little card. It was like the nicest thing ever. And uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. I thought it was awesome. That was awesome. I think it's crazy. You're still growing yeah, that, I man. I don't even think I have that culture a- anymore. You know, I've gone through cultures like people go through clothes. Um, and so, you know, it's a good one. It's a good one. I will. Maybe I'll send it back. I was going to say, if you send it uh, back to me, that would be that would be awesome because, you know, just be it'd be some like, novelty uh, and nostalgia. Right. Like uh, I, I definitely I, I can't even uh, imagine which culture that that originally was uh, because of, like I said earlier, the Pokemon syndrome where you just trade and trade and get all these different things. So, but nonetheless, it'd be cool. I could run a batch of kits with it uh, and, and do like a, uh, an old school Ganoderma kit. Well, it is a ferocious culture. Like it's unbelievable how uh, tenacious it is. So even I after think... seven years. Oh yeah, no, it's ridiculous. Um, you grow it out on a plate. Like I swear, like it's hard to cut with your scalpel. Oh yeah. And, uh, it fruits really easily. And, uh, that's the thing. Reishi. Yeah. It's an absolutely beautiful culture. So, um, yeah, still have it seven years later. So there you go. And I don't know how long, like you must've had it for a little while too. So it's, it's probably a super old one. Right. <laughs> so, but speaking of sin and stuff, you said you, you got culture small over the world. You've been doing some really cool, uh, I want to call it like, uh, almost like mycophilanthropy. Yeah, worldwide. that's what I call it. That's, so, that's what I call it, for sure. Yeah, no, that's really cool. I just want to read what, what it says on your website here. So you said, my long-term mission with mushroom growing is to establish a fair trade network of mushroom growers in developing nations. This network would develop dependable revenue streams for these people by reusing locally available agricultural waste to produce high-quality mm-hmm. mushrooms and mushroom-based products for import and distribution through the U.S. and perhaps even worldwide. Tell me a little bit about the uh, the uh, mycophilanthropy that you're doing. I just think that's so cool. So uh, I read a book by a Dutchman named Peter Oei, O-E-I, and uh, he is uh, he's he's all of his work is centric to how to grow mushrooms in de- developing countries, from like Nepal to Uruguay to wherever you want to grow mushrooms. That's not typically you know thought of when you're when you're talking about growing mushrooms and cultivation he's done it he's gone there he's put in the work he's researched the local mushrooms how they grow it the the different techniques and and he's worked to improve these and uh really when i saw i've always wanted to help people with mushrooms like i've always wanted to give back because mushrooms have given me my life they literally have and and so i've always wanted to give back and understanding like oyster mushrooms they can be grown on i think it's 250 confirmed substrates that they've been uh you know documented to grow on and, and when I, you know, put all these pieces together, uh, I want to help people. I want to help people with mushrooms and oyster mushrooms can be grown on basically anything. I was like, well, there's, there's all sorts of waste all over the place. There's just got to be a way to, to educate people who, 
you know, don't have running water or electricity on, on how to grow mushrooms. And one of the things that I really liked early on with uh, the mushroom grower subreddit was like these low tech backyard mushroom grower techniques, as I like to call them. And so, you know, my, my background initially has been uh, really low tech and I love doing like passive farming. I love removing all these complicated human-esque things that we try to add to the mushroom growing operation and, and just letting nature do its thing. And so, uh, it was through welcome to mushroom hour, uh, Darren, uh, that I became aware of Josephine in Uganda and she was trying to grow button mushrooms. Some guy told her that, Oh, let's grow button mushrooms. You can grow a bunch of button mushrooms. It's really easy. And they spent, I think it was a year, maybe two years trying to grow button mushrooms and, and failing every time they never grew one mushroom because the, the process is really hard, especially out in Uganda, you know, that's not. The place that I would think of to grow button mushrooms. But I heard about this story. I heard about this woman who was super dedicated to growing mushrooms. And I'd just gotten done helping uh, a guy named Raymond in Kenya build a mushroom growing farm uh, out there. He built a, a mushroom barn. Uh, but the honestly, I, I failed in that first experiment with, with Kenya in, in how to get him to grow mushrooms uh, was like the educational piece was missing. Uh, a key point and that was spawn he couldn't get spawn he couldn't source spawn he couldn't make spawn and and that was really uh, tricky you know that was a tricky hurdle to get over because uh covid happened it, it locked up the supply routes i couldn't send him anything in the mail so it was like effectively dead in the water as soon as the mushroom barn was built it was just like sorry raymond i don't know what else to do because we, i can't get you spawn spores anything i don't know what to do and so then i heard about josephine and uh, I started talking with her and she said she's got somebody sending her spores and, and she talked to the universities uh, who might have been able to give them spawn, but it, it never worked out to get them spawn. A long story short, I sat with Josephine uh, every month for a year and a half or so, the last year and a half. And we got her in a still air box. We got her making cardboard spawn. Then we got her making grain spawn. Then we got her growing mushrooms. And, and now... She's poised to have the first, she's building currently the first uh, mushroom training school in Uganda, probably the first mushroom training school in Africa to begin with, uh, which is, is really cool. And she's got this mission to be able to export 500 tons of mushrooms next year with a network of uh, 500 uh, mushroom farmers. Uh, women and children are primarily the market for her, her educational efforts as far as mushrooms goes. And uh, it's crazy cool because like during COVID, uh, it's still ongoing over there a little bit. Uh, things are dying down a little bit more, um, which is good. But during COVID, like the markets were locked down. Nobody could go anywhere. They couldn't leave their houses or their villages in a lot of cases. And people that she was able to teach how to grow mushrooms were able to thrive in this, in this time uh, just by growing a few pounds of mushrooms per week, which is crazy because uh, not only are they having uh, additional – financial security, but they're, they're also, you know, uh, they're providing security to the communities and in, in that they're providing a healthy food source at a low cost to, to the, to the, to the community. And they're also taking waste and, and reintegrating it into the, the economy. And so for me, uh, that was like the most powerful thing to see was like how they could take people from poverty in a matter of months and, and grow these mushrooms and, and, and put them in a position of power. And they start oftentimes underneath like a bed or in their kitchen or, you know, anywhere they have space. But the cool thing about growing mushrooms is that you don't need, you know, 10 acres of land and $50,000 in equipment. You can start growing mushrooms anywhere with some plastic bags you probably have from the grocery store and some scraps from the farmer down the street, you know. And that's, that's what, for me, is the most inspiring thing about mushrooms and power mushrooms is that they can grow on almost anything and that they can also put people in desperate situations in, in positions of power. You know, that's like, it still warms my heart just to be even a small part of that big, amazing mission that she's working on. And so we're getting there, you know, we're, we're, we're pretty close to having a, a, all the goals that she has set in place met and she should be in place to, to start exporting mushrooms by next year mid-year so um she's got 250 plus women she's trained so far oh wow which is like crazy considering she started in a still air box yeah and uh she's got those women locked into contracts so that they can buy the mushrooms from them and uh so that everything is taken care of and then they josephine's gonna buy the mushrooms from them sell them and, and eventually become an exporter of uh mushrooms in uganda so it's like ah 
we're winning, man. It's cool. Yeah, no, that's so cool. I mean, and you're right. Like oyster mushrooms in particular are absolutely perfect for that, right? Because you, you know, they are easy to grow. There's strains that can grow in pretty much any environment. Like whether you're growing them in Pennsylvania or whether you're growing them in Uganda, I mean, there's slightly different techniques that you can sure. use, but I mean, uh, mushrooms are absolutely perfect for that. And yeah, they grow a lot of valuable food. Um, I didn't realize the volume though. That's uh, how, how many tons of mushrooms do you say she's planning on? on she wants export? to do 500 tons per year. That's that's super ambitious, wow. I mean, right? Like, yeah. yeah. That's that's awesome though. I mean, why not? Well, exactly. Like, that's where I'm at. And she's got the math. Like, she's the most accountable person in the world. She every month we meet, she gives me the receipts of every dollar she's spent. We go over it. We go over the forecasting. We go over the issues. And and it's cool just to to see where she's come from a still air box because now she's doing she's making grain spawn and she's 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 a spawn maker now. And and you know how difficult spawn making can be even in yeah. a controlled situation like in a lab. Um, and she's doing it without a lab. Like she doesn't have a lab. All she has is a still air box. She just got a pressure cooker like a month ago. Oh wow! Um, so you know you can imagine how how tricky it has been for her. And one advantage that we just gave them uh, was cold pasteurization. Now, um, in that they're they're no longer using steam barrels to to steam their substrates. They're just using lime. Okay. Um, and is that working out pretty good? Oh yeah, she's loving it. It's faster colonization, better yields. Everything's easier. Um, and, and it, it's more accessible. They were sharing steam barrels. So what happened was, you know, I'd give her some money or she'd raise some money and, and then they'd build, a, a community, uh, growing system. Like a, they'd get the steaming barrel. They'd give them all the equipment, the bags, the spawn, the, the raw materials for the substrate. And they'd, they'd all kind of share everything. And now everybody can do it on their own time at their own pace without having to, you know, share this big steam barrel, which. I think enables more people to do it because they can always get water. They can always haul water. That's, you know, they need water to steam it or to do cold pasteurization, but it takes away the element of needing heat and uh, it makes things a lot more uh, accessible to the average person out there. So, you know, now we don't need to raise money for these, these giant pasteurizers. We can just dig right in. And she said, limes, you know, basically it's, it's dirt cheap. Um, so, you know, it's, it's really, it's a win-win for everybody. And I'm glad that we've gotten her to that point now because, uh, now we're going to get her out to uh, MycoFest out here in Pennsylvania. We're going to, me and William, we're going to fly her out here and we're going to set up a demonstration site. How they're growing in Uganda is they have these, these little huts that they built and that they line with uh, banana leaves on the outside. They have a tin roof and they put sand on the inside and they keep the sand moist. So it's their, it's essentially their perlite for those of you who have understandings of uh, cultivation. You know, that's, that's your humidity reservoir. And they just keep the sand wet. Once everything's colonized, they initiate fruiting and, and they're good to go. Um, and, and it's really, it's a simple, but like really beautiful process. And Tony, I could send you a video too, uh, if you haven't seen it yet, just to, you know, if you ever wanted to share that, like, I love trying to get as much of a spotlight on Josephine as I can. Cause when I first got a hold of her, like nobody had heard of her. And now like everybody's climbing out of the woodworks to help. And I think it's amazing, but um, I, I think we can get even more support by casting a, a bigger spotlight on her. So, um, yeah, definitely. Yeah, well, I'll, uh, for everyone watching this, I'll put the link to your, in your about section, you have like a really good write up and there's a bunch of cool pictures and I think the video's on there as well. Um, and if there's anywhere else you want me to point people to, sure. let me know for sure. Cause yeah, I just man. think it's such a, such a cool project. And you're right, that's the thing about mushrooms. Like it, it can be complicated, obviously. It can be these massive industrial operations, but it doesn't necessarily have to be, right? Like you could, there's so many different ways you can grow mushrooms. And even for the people listening, like even if you don't want to start a mushroom farm, like Josephine's doing, grow 500 tons a year, <laughs> there's still some pretty low-tech methods you can do just in your backyard or, or whatever. And um, I guess that's the other thing that you do we didn't really talk about. It, but you sell a lot of mushroom kits, right? I mean, if, if somebody wants to grow lion's mane, for example, they don't have to get a pressure cooker and they don't have to get all this stuff. They can just get a kit, yep. basically put on your counter. And I think a lot of people would be uh, surprised at how easy it is to grow lion's mane mushroom at home, right? It's fantastically easy. And, and the one thing that I do tell people is you can have 10 different houses, even side by side on the same block, trying to grow mushrooms in the same way. And you'll have 10 different results, you know, with minor variances here or there, or maybe even major variances because of the, the humidity is like the biggest thing for mushrooms as, as, as most of us who are in the space know. But for those of you who don't uh, know and understand, the biggest tool you can get to help ensure your mushroom growing success isn't a humidifier or anything like that. It's a hygrometer. A hygrometer measures your humidity and oftentimes your temperature. And without one, and without actually understanding the humidity in the environment you're trying to grow in, 
you're going to fail um, eventually. And you'll be like, well, what's going on here? But uh, the biggest thing that I've learned is, is that people try to treat mushrooms like plants. They're like, okay, let's just put it on a windowsill here. We'll give it some sunlight and, and, and we'll spray it once a day. That's not good enough in most cases. Um, seasonally, uh, in Pennsylvania here, I can grow mushrooms out in the open air from the spring uh, until midsummer. And then uh, at the end of summer to fall, I can just grow mushrooms in the open air. I put one on my counter, put one in my kitchen, put one in my basement, in my garage. But during winter and during high summer uh, where it's really hot, I can't grow lion's mane like that. And I need to control the humidity. And the most common way people do that is they get these little green greenhouses. You've probably seen the five tier greenhouses. Or they take a plastic storage tote and they, they spray it on the inside a couple times a day and that traps the humidity and, and you're good to go. Um, so while, yes, it is really easy, sometimes your environment may need a, a little bit of adjusting to, to ensure the best grow, right? Because like when you see like a picture perfect example of lion's mane and then you grow something that looks like a scraggly cauliflower, you're a little upset. And you're like, well, what's going on here? Right. And oftentimes that's, that's either humidity or oxygen. And, you know, just like if you have a pet and you put it in a container, you need to let that pet breathe, right? Or it's not going to do so well. Uh, same thing with mushrooms. And, and that's like the one fun thing about mushrooms is how responsive they are to the environment. Um, you can have a mushroom that's growing really terribly, make a minor adjustment, and then all of a sudden it, it bounces back within, you know, sometimes – a matter of hours you can see a physiological change in, in the mushroom and, and especially with something like reishi where like you can measure the growth per day and almost almost like fractions of an inch uh, like half an inch to an inch depending on how uh how your environment is so uh, you know there's a lot of different mushrooms you can grow and most of the ones that we do grow commercially are really easy to grow but like there are some mushrooms that are really tricky too um so you know uh like my yeah. or unoki you know, they're very, very complicated, but lion's mane, I've sold thousands of lion's mane kits and, uh, we haven't really had too many failures. You know, we replace everything, um, uh, that people really like, if it gets like turns green or something like we'll replace it. Or if, if they work with us and they can't get it to grow anything for some reason, we'll replace it. But the most common issue we've seen is the humidity and people forget that part. So, uh, you know, if you're thinking about growing mushrooms, get a hygrometer, understand the humidity in your space first. And if you have humidity above 60, 70 percent, you can grow mushrooms pretty, pretty well like that. But if you don't, you can always just get a tub or, or a little greenhouse and, and throw them in there. And so that's my that's my stipulation. Yes, mushroom growing is easy, but humidity is, is sort of like the biggest challenge that you're facing. Yeah. And I think, too, everyone like the first thing everyone tries to grow is always oysters because oysters, they are easy to grow, but uh, they do need a heck of a lot of fresh air. And that can be hard to maintain. Uh, if you want to also contain, you know, maintain the humidity, but lion's mane is one of these ones that like, it's in my opinion, it's one of the perfect things for kits. That's why I think it's so cool that you do it. Cause like I've had lion's mane that like I forget about and like I'll put it in the garage somewhere or whatever. Yeah. And then I'll come back like a week later. There's this like big, beautiful, perfect yeah. looking lion's mane. And they're like, always the best when you forget about <laughs> them and leave them in a space that has lots of oxygen. You know, I always tell people that, uh, the amount of fresh air really dictates how big and happy your mushrooms are going to be because, you know, we're trying to recreate these conditions high in the trees and these dense forests where, you know, there is no such thing as CO2 buildup, right? But in our confined spaces, we, we, we have CO2 buildup and the mushrooms themselves are, are respiring CO2. They're, they're out, their output is CO2. So when you have a lot of them growing, especially uh, in one space, it, it becomes harder to manage that. But on a small scale, it's really easy. Like, I, my favorite thing was one day I forgot about a kit, just like you said, uh, I, I was in the basement and I was doing a photo shoot. I was just taking some pictures and uh, um, I, I left the kit down there and, and I came back two, three weeks later and this thing is bigger than my chest. And I'm like, wow, like this is amazing. <laughs> and that's, that's when I really started getting into to more passive fruiting. And now I'll just grow in, I have two rather large garages on my property. I'll just grow in my garages without doing anything. You know, I'll set up a humidifier just in case but I'll have it set to like 50% humidity or something. And it never needs to go off because here in Pennsylvania in the spring and in the fall, it's generally pretty humid. And lion's mane is, is very forgiving, especially if you can get it started. If you can get the lion's mane to form pins or baby mushrooms, uh, then you can really kind of neglect it. Uh, as soon as it pins, it's, it's just going to grow. And like I've grown up to 95, hundred degrees, no problem. And I've had my humidity drop as low as 30% and still had mushrooms grow, uh, which, which is, you know, According to the book, that shouldn't happen. But you know, we're here in real life, and and in real life, I find that we do deviate from the the given parameters in texts and and in research quite a bit. And and I think that's what makes lion's mane so flexible. 
um, as far as, as growing goes, because it does have a wide range. And, you know, just to show how powerful Lion's Mane is. One time I took a trip to, I drove to Arizona from Pennsylvania, a guy in Tucson, just south of Tucson, gave me a mushroom block from All Red Family Fungi. Um, he gave me one of his Lion's Mane kits, uh, or blocks rather. And uh, we had that thing in the car. My intention was to grow it like on the trip. And I never got around to doing it because it's a busy trip. We had the dogs, we had our daughter, and we were just driving everywhere. So it sat in the car the whole time, didn't leave the car. We drove through Death Valley. It was like 110, 115. Yep. And this thing was just sitting in the car. Every time we'd get out of the car and go do something, it would just get cooked. Anyway, long story short, we get back home. It was like three weeks in the car. And uh, I set it in my garage, just like we were just talking about. And uh, I opened it up because I'm like, mm, it might work, it might not. And sure enough, about two, three weeks later, I come out there and happy, healthy mushroom just sitting there staring at me. And I'm just like, man, this thing has been subjected to extremes, like ridiculous extremes. And it's still happy to grow. Um, it didn't die or any of that. Uh, you know, all the stuff that, that we would be afraid of in that situation, you know, thermal death, uh, didn't happen. And it's just like, you know, that shows the sheer power of mushrooms. And I think that's what's one of the the cool things, uh, at least for me, is is seeing how the mushrooms can survive almost anything you give them. Yeah, life uh, finds a way. As it does, I, mean, yeah. I had a similar experience. In, uh, I was in South Lake Tahoe, and we found a Amanita muscaria, but just in its egg form. And I just thought it was so cool, and I wanted to show people what the egg form looks like. So I took it, I put it in like a paper bag, and I forgot about it in my truck, and we drove home, which was like I don't know, thousands of miles, you know, to Alberta from South Lake Tahoe. And when I finally opened the paper bag, the mushroom had grown inside the paper bag and like totally opened up. And it was <laughs> just like beautiful Amanita muscaria, not in its egg form anymore. Um, so, yeah, and you see like mushrooms like pushing through cracks in the sidewalk or yeah. whatever, growing out of... Uh, yeah, I see that happen all the time. Or like you forget about a bag somewhere and you don't open it and like the oyster mushrooms will find a little pinhole in yep. the bag and like grow these huge, beautiful clusters underneath your shelf or something. <laughs> It's, it's pretty amazing. No, they are. And like even like freezing. So one time talking about the kits, one time I had a guy when I was still really new to business, he was like, hey, I want 100 lion's mane substrates. I was like, oh, cool. Sure, I'll make that for you. And I was a brand new business guy. I didn't know about like making people pay up front or sign any paperwork or anything. You know, there was, there was none of that. And so he sniffed me. And I was sitting there with 100 lion's mane substrates, and I didn't have anywhere to grow them. I didn't have anybody else who wanted them. It was getting to winter, so I wasn't really interested in growing. Um, uh, and so I let them sit over winter and they froze solid. Uh, and they, they were like, they, I was pretty sure that I wasted a whole bunch of effort and lost a whole lot of money, but I ended up, uh, fruiting them in spring in my garage. I opened up every bag and that was like my intro to Instagram was like, Hey guys, look at the lions down here. I got a hundred lions made blocks and they're just growing like crazy. And I think they actually fruited better than the substrates that we rush along. You know, typically when I inoculate a substrate, it's ready to fruit in seven to 10 days. Um, and these sat for maybe four to five months before they actually got open. Huh. And I think that consolidation period and mimicking maybe the, the natural processes that these mushrooms would be exposed to in their natural environment, I think maybe there's something to that. Like whether it's a consolidation time or whether it's a freeze or maybe some combination of both. But they, I was getting pound and a half, two pounds per per harvest, like which was like that's pretty good off a of seven pound block. It's really good, um, as far as I'm concerned, because I usually get about a pound and a quarter to a pound and a half uh, on the first flush. So I saw you know an additional quarter to half a pound, uh, which I thought was pretty cool. And like the same thing with some reishi, uh, I've done both where like I let uh, maybe 50 reishi kits sit in the sun during summertime. Uh, they must have gotten 110, 115 degrees in the bags. And uh, I eventually grew them and they had no problems. And then there was, there was 10 that sat on my porch over the winter this winter. And I'm growing them in my, my windowsill right now. Literally no humidity chamber, no nothing. Just poke some holes in the bags and the bags are filling up. I posted a video about that maybe a week or 10 days ago or something. Um, but it's like, it's remarkable how strong they are. I always feel bad about doing it, but I honestly believe mushrooms like to be stressed because they always <laughs> yeah. like outperform if they're put under pressure. Yeah, for sure. And you're not the first person to tell me that. I know uh, like Brian Callow from What the Fungus. I don't know if you know him. He's yeah. got a YouTube channel. He's got a farm out in Summerland, uh, British Columbia, Canada. He, he overwinters uh, king oysters, I think, and he freezes the bags over the winter and then fruits them in the spring and they, they turn out awesome. Yeah. So he figured that out by accident as well and was like, damn, this actually works pretty there's something to it, man. There's probably a word to describe it, uh, you know, whatever process is going on. But I just think it's more natural than than this rushed production because we want to see things happen as fast as we can. And we need our production yesterday, you know. But 
by letting nature take its time and go slower, we, we often, I think, get better results. Yeah. And, you know, there's obviously a lot of farms, you know, overseas that just work with the seasons, right? I mean, they'll grow reishi once a year, they harvest it literally once a year and you go into these greenhouses where the reishi's fruiting and you can barely stand in there because it's too hot. Like it's, you know, 35 degrees Celsius, whatever that is in Fahrenheit, but like super hot, super humid and the reishi is just growing absolutely perfect, right? And, you know, the lion's mane doesn't like that so much, so they'll wait till October to fruit the lion's mane. But, um, it, you know, working with the seasons and working with the mushrooms, I think that's really cool. But um, one thing I wanted to dig into, so you talked about, you know, kind of starting Mike Tyson, where you had your, your 100 uh, lion's mane blocks and started to sell kits. What has that been like? What has that process been like? Do you find, like, what is it like uh, running a mushroom kit business? Obviously, it's a lot of work. Um, there's probably a lot of education involved as well uh, for people who get these kits and just expect mushrooms to grow automatically. Um, but w- what has your experience been like being kind of like a micro, uh, sorry, myco entrepreneur? It's been ups and downs and a lot of patience. You know, I'm thankful for my time on Reddit early on because it taught me how to talk with anybody and give like a positive, warm, happy vibe, right? And also to, to talk with people in a way that can't be scrutinized, because that's like the one thing that Reddit is really special for. If you like misspeak on Reddit, everybody's going to let you know. Um, so for me, you know, I'm thankful for that experience on Reddit because it did help me to enter into the space. Uh, it's highly focused on customer service. You know, you get your kit, you're having problems, you have questions, you didn't read the label, you're excited, you just wing stuff. Like I have people who just like get them. And then I had this one guy, he threw away 10 kits. It's like there's a couple hundred bucks worth of kits. He just threw them away because he's like they were bruised from shipping, which is totally fine. It's, it's expected. But like he thought they were bad. So he threw them all in his compost pile. And I'm like, dude. And he's like, I want a refund. And I'm like, dude, no, yeah. no, let's circle back. Please don't. And so it's a lot of trial and error and putting your head inside of the customer who's going to do everything wrong. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, hiring customer service was was my biggest accomplishment, I think, because that took off so much stress from my plate. You know, constantly managing the email inbox and things like that uh, on top of socials was 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 always really hard, especially when you have those customers who might not understand that everything's OK, but are still really stressed out about it. And so, you know, just dealing with those those situations was like the most taxing mm-hmm. um, for me. Um, but now we've got a pretty good system as far as customer service goes. We have very few write-ins anymore because we've got all of the information on our website. We've got our YouTube videos mm-hmm. and we've got uh really good labels that that have like every condition that that has ever been addressed uh to us or concern that has been addressed to us on on the label so right. as long as they're reading it most people are, are understanding but the biggest issue has, has really been just breakage in the mail lion's mane is lighter growing in general compared to something like pleurotus uh, oyster mushrooms or like anoderma so like we'll have some breakage in the substrate and then people are like hey you sent me an uncolonized block I actually made a video on Instagram where I beat up a block to show people how it, it's solid white on the outside, but on the inside, it's it's it looks like uncolonized substrate, and that's because it's lion's mane. Um, so like that has been our biggest issue. And you know, for people that are uh, that I see trying to sell lion's mane kits, I'm always like, hey, add more spawn, get it a little thicker so that it doesn't get destroyed during shipping because it, 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 that's really what it is. And our substrates are like. They're like 50% spawn basically. Um, but like I said, I want seven to 10 days colonization. I don't want to wait two or three weeks. I want to be able to time my stuff really predictably. And so like, that's the biggest piece of advice I can give to anybody who's selling kits uh, or mushroom substrates in general is use more spawn, get things out there faster and more consistently and with less errors. Cause by using more spawn, it's not only faster but nothing else is ever going to grow other than your intended uh, mycelium, right? You won't have any issues with bacteria or, uh, like trike or anything like that. So, you know, that was like the big piece of our success was just learning to use more spawn. You know, it's cool that you can use a teaspoon of spawn per bag, yeah, but yeah. that's going to take a month and a half to grow, yeah. you know, and I don't have time for that. So, so for us, like that was the one thing. And I borrowed that from the agaricus industry, you know, my time working in the button mushroom farms, uh, I supervised some 30 guys while they were filling up button mushroom uh, doubles as they call them. And we'd work on, the capacity of about a million to a million and a half pounds a week of buttons on average. Wow. Uh, holidays were sometimes up to two. Yeah, it's crazy. Wow. And so going from self-taught mushroom guy to like that environment was really awesome, but it also confused me a lot because I learned everything that I knew from the shroomery and from doing stuff my own, you know, and, and trial and error. And uh, it was at the time that I was standing there watching these guys, what, what would happen was they would, they would pull up a semi-truck 
the semi truck would get compost loaded into it with spawn mixed in at the time of uh, the loading. Then the truck would back into a, one of those mushroom doubles. They'd have these cool conveyor belt systems with nets that pulled the compost out into the beds. And then these guys, the 20 to 30 guys I was supervising, they'd be standing on top of it, tamping it down, dancing on it, trying to get the substrate really compact and level and even in the beds. And I was sitting there scratching my head like, but you got to burn the place down. It's going to get moldy. I don't understand how like they're dancing on it. They were just outside and it's open air and I don't understand. But it was at that point that I had like a eureka moment where it's like, oh, they're using enough spawn on a selective media to ensure that the target mycelium colonizes before anything else grows. And all we're really doing is mushroom growers is managing the mycelium. Yeah. And when I like had that moment of, of clarity, I was like, oh. I'm doing things like the wrong way. And like, I take substrate that fall, fell off the, the trucks or the conveyors on the floor, throw it in a shoe box and have it colonized. And I'm like, after I saw that, I was like, man, we're trying way too hard and we're getting way too stressed out about contamination. Well, you know, it's really about outpacing competitors, right? I think the typical arc of like a mushroom growers learning curve is like at first, you know, nothing works. And then because everything gets contaminated and then you go like way overboard and you like shower before you do it, you yeah. like wear gloves and sleeves yeah. and like put on a hazmat suit and the whole thing. And then it starts to work again. But then you realize you can keep backing that off and then you back it off to the point where you're comfortable with. And like, now I don't even wear so gloves. Like growers. it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And or, or, or like you said, sometimes you'll drop something on the floor or whatever and be like, yeah, this, it'll probably be fine. And like, you know, you just get, you get an act for figuring out what the mushrooms can handle and what they can't. Right. So yeah, I can picture that scene in a big agaricus farm, and uh, but in the agaricus farming, like the it's the compost that's really the secret sauce. Yeah, hundred percent. Right? I mean, it is the substrate. Yeah, and so and, and there's a lot of processing that goes into making that just right. Yeah, so it would go through. It was probably four to five weeks from start to finish, from the time that they get the straw. It's about this this long, and they get all sorts of agricultural waste from chicken manure, chicken litter, as they called it. Um, to cocoa shells, to sometimes they would bring leaves in from the, the local municipalities when they were doing like leaf collecting and, and stuff. And now that's a substrate for some extra carbs. They'd add corn cob to it. They'd have this whole science based on, on their, their compost. And it would start in one big pile and then it would get moved and turned and wet over the course of a few weeks. And then it would get, when it was broken down to about half the size that it started off, it would get brought to something called the tunnels. And the tunnels are basically like an advanced composting system where they blow air underneath the, the compost and they control the, t the temperature and they measure the ammonia and they get it just perfect to be, uh, as I said earlier, a selective media for the mycelium. And so they, they worked a lot with Penn State to uh, develop this process. And um, it, it, it's, it's, that's the meat and potatoes of the mushroom growing. And that's why it's so successful is the, the compost. And they, they used to grow it was something like three pounds per square inch. And now they're doing like eight or nine pounds per square inch, thanks to changing the composting, changing the strains that they're working with, um, and just some other techniques. Like they inoculate their casing layer at the time of casing, which is something that they never used to do, but it helps expedite things, reduce disease, and ultimately keep production up. So um, it's, it's really cool. It's fascinating. And I learned a lot, you know, uh, up until that point, I'd grown uh, a lot of, like I, I grew my fair share of cubensis. I, I've stopped that, you know, uh, but like it was cool seeing what was essentially like a large scale cubensis factory, but with agaricus, right? It was like the same process. So for me, it was super fascinating. And uh, it was just, it was very humbling too, because I realized that I was trying too hard in a lot of ways and that I could really back it off and and, and sort of chill out a little bit. You know, like I said, I, I, don't, I didn't have to burn my house down or anything anymore <laughs> because mold wasn't scary. Yeah. It was understanding that we were just outpacing that. Um, that, was, that was really like a, a eureka moment for me. And like, I've done a lot of open air, Pleurotus and I've tried open air everything, but Pleurotus works the best. Um, but yeah, it's it was definitely a really cool experience. It was just too corporate for me, yeah. and that's why I got out. I made it probably nine or ten months before I was like, ah, I can't really do this anymore. It was cool, but yeah. you know, six days, seventy hours a week at a big corporate thing wasn't my wasn't my style. You wanted to do your own thing. I had to. Yeah, leads into my next question. A uh, couple of random questions here. If you weren't into mushrooms, what would you be doing? So I, I just had this uh, conversation. Like somebody asked me that a couple weeks ago, and I posted on Instagram. I was like, uh, I don't want to sound too much like Joe Rogan, but I was really into DMT, and not really smoking DMT or, or ingesting it, but making it was something that I just like really loved doing. I don't know. It was really fascinating to me. And so I was like, if I could, if I just had no concerns about money, 
I'd be making artisanal DMT just for fun, just for the art of it, not even for like giving it to anybody or anything, just for doing it and making video games and making techno music. That would be that would be me, hundred <laughs> percent. That sounds that sounds pretty good. Um, yeah, I guess the, the chemistry of it all is, is super interesting to you. Is what you're, is, is one of the things you're saying? Yeah. So th there's just something to be said for you know starting with raw materials and then refining them until they're at their purest form. Uh, and, and then doing it in, in such a way that it, it literally makes, in my opinion, art. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of it was just learning by accident and being lazy or neglectful or whatever that I, that I had these eureka moments where I was like, wow, you know, I can take this stuff, I can purify it and then end up with like solid rocks that are transparent, almost look like little diamonds. It's like, you know, for me, that was just super fun. And how much power is in that little thing that I've created was just like, huh. You know, and I'm not, <laughs> yeah. I'm not huge into to doing psychedelics anymore because I've had my fair share. I'm good. I feel like I got the call. I answered it. I hung up. I'm good for a while. Um, but like, there's just something about being part of that process that, that is really exciting um, and, and fascinating to me. And, and I can't quite put my finger on what it is, but it's just, I don't maybe it's just because it's illegal or something. I don't know. But for me, it's, it's really cool. Uh, and this, that's like really where my heart would be. I totally agree with you in the fact that it's, and I think a lot of people who are into mushrooms entered it from one of two ways, like either the Paul Stamets route, or I know a lot of people that got into mushrooms because of Terrence McKenna. And like you basically quoted him in the, in the last uh, thing you said there, but um, you know, he talks a lot about mushrooms. And I think once people realize, you know, they get into it through the psychedelics, the psilocybin, they might start growing cubensis or whatever, but then they realize that like all mushrooms are pretty cool in their own way. And, you know, I can grow lion's mane or I can do some of these other gourmet and medicinal mushrooms without having to always be looking over my shoulder. Um, and yeah, but I mean, that's a pretty common thing. I think a lot of people come into mushrooms from that route and just find a fascination with myco mycology in general, right? Yeah, I don't know very many people who haven't gotten in in that route. You know, uh, I, I know one, uh, but he's like a PhD. He he is a, like a mycologist by trade. That's what he does. Like he's hired by these big mushroom farms all over the world to go everywhere. And he just got interested in it academically uh, at college. And I'm sure there may have been some magic mushrooms at play. You know, <laughs> given his age, he's like 65, 70. Um, so uh, I'm sure. But uh, yeah, he's like he 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 wasn't into it like from from that from that perspective. He was just purely interested in the biology of the mushrooms, and you know I think that's really cool too. But I'd say nine out of ten times that's that's the route that that most people take, uh, just in my network and, and experiences so far. And there's always yeah. exceptions to that rule, sure. But um, you know I don't I, I joke that you know most people don't get excited about mushrooms for no reason. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Uh, it's funny though because. Another character who's very well known and uh, talks a lot about not only DMT but mushrooms as well is a guy named Mike Tyson. And I bet when you came up with your handle on Reddit, you didn't expect that uh, the boxer would also be be looking and be interested in, in psychedelics. I don't know if you've, you've seen some of the things that Mike Tyson has, has said about mushrooms, but yeah. it's just it's pretty interesting. No, it and, is. And uh, like one day, yeah, I thought he'd be an he's going to knock on my door and knock me out one day. So I got to worry about that. Uh, <laughs> has he has he contacted you yet at all no i have like friends that know him and uh i'm, I'm working with uh, another guy who's done direct business with him and you know I, I always just keep it like like out here i'm like hey you know no i'm not i don't know i don't know how to feel about it and i'm nervous and i don't want to open that door because once you open it you can't close it right and and that's like one of the things that's kind of pressuring me to to focus more on harissi labs is that like i don't want to make this guy upset you know it'd be really cool if i could just hand this off to him and say hey look i've already done the work i've grown this business now you take it and you do whatever you want with it i think that'd be really cool but like really i just don't want to make anybody mad i never thought until it was like a year and some change after starting mike that uh i was talking to a lawyer and she was like he's gonna sue you i'm like oh i don't <laughs> like to hear that i don't want to i don't know i don't know this um, I, and so like, I didn't, I don't, I don't know how to feel. And everybody that I know that knows him says, no, nah, he's going to be totally fine with it. He doesn't care. Even if he knows about it, he doesn't care. I, I was going to say just the fact that it's mushrooms. I think it'd be cool with it. You listen to some of the interviews. He's like, you yeah, know, mushrooms just chill him out. Um, and and it, it's changed his perspective on so many things. Right. So I can't imagine Mike Tyson coming out. I think he'd be cool with it, but it's his legal team that I'm worried about. Not him, but his legal team, you know, they're just jumping at the bit to try and try and get somebody because they got they got to they gotta justify their their budget right so I'm, I'm not worried about him but i'm worried about his legal team for sure 
Well, like he said, everyone's got a plan until you get punched in the mouth. So <laughs> who knows? Who knows what'll happen? He's also said, uh, I wrote it down, it's a fungus. We're made out of this shit. When we die, we turn into mushrooms. I mean, that's a Mike Tyson quote. <laughs> that's cool. Is, I haven't heard that one before. Which, Yeah, no, it's just funny. I was watching some some of his interviews before this. Like, he's he's really into it. It's yeah. like his thing now. Uh, DMT and, and uh, psilocybin. I didn't really know he was funny. into DMT, but that, that makes sense. Yeah, you got to... Uh, I'll, I'll send you a link to it after this. There's one podcast that he, he talks all about it. Um, and it's like 5-MEO DNT, the toad. And uh, talks about his experience with that. It was like changed everything for him, he said. Which is, um, and you know, that's a guy that suffered a lot of uh, f- like physical trauma to sure. the head, right? So you can imagine uh, maybe it's been. I'd love to get him on Lion's Mane, man. man. That, that would be awesome. Right, get him involved with uh, Heresium Labs, maybe. Right, <laughs> it'd be a perfect, it'd be a perfect bridge. No, that'd be too cool. But yeah, definitely send me that link because I, I, I'd be interested to check that out. Uh, you know, he's, I, I still remember like when I was like probably six or maybe seven when the whole thing with Holyfield happened. It was back when pay per view was still a thing. My dad was super excited about watching the fight, and everybody was making this big deal because he bit this dude's ear off. So like, I never watched his fights growing up or anything, and I wasn't like the biggest fan. So it's interesting. You know, how this one moment that stood out to me as a kid, like, I don't remember any other fight that he's ever watched, but I remember that one because he was, it was a huge, huge deal. Um, and so it's interesting how, you know, these things just kind of come full circle and, and, and really show themselves uh, as time goes on. And so I don't know what the future has in stock or store for, for me and Mike Tyson. Um, but, you know, just seeing that he's in the space is, is really cool. Uh, but it's also, like I said, kind of concerning because I just don't want to, I don't want to make anybody mad. I never intended to you know take this this far and now it's like feeding my family directly so it's like i gotta i gotta change a little bit um and and that's where the the big focus on on harissim labs is is for sure yeah but it's also just because you know that's what i want to do and uh i'm sure you can you've done a little bit of the 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 gourmet side right you guys started i remember you guys had a kickstarter on the subreddit early on in the days um, for your mushroom growing room. Yeah. Um, you guys were doing buckets and stuff, right? Yeah. I mean, that's the path that we took. We started growing, uh, we, you know, we had a little farm and we started uh, doing, you know, growing. That's what was our plan to just to grow fresh gourmet uh, mushrooms. And we also did the grain spawn and, you know, we sold all the supplies and stuff like that. But again, we have a super strong passion for the functional mushrooms. Tegan, who's a co-founder, also my wife, she's got a background in nutrition and food science mm-hmm. and product development. We put those two things together and saw there wasn't a lot of great options on the market. And, you know, this is a space we really understood. And there seemed to be a demand for it. And, uh, you know, how this goes, we just followed whatever seemed to be working best and what we had a passion for. Sure. And it's worked out really well and uh, allows us to do do things like this. Um, but, yeah, I'm super stoked about everything that you're doing. So you mentioned, uh, so you got MikeTyson.com. That's where people can go and get kits. I think you also sell Spawn. There's lots of really great uh, stuff to learn how to grow there. You've got Heresium Labs, which you talked about, which is your uh, lion's mane tincture, which looks amazing, uh, by the way. So um, where else can people find you if they wanted to learn more about Mike Tyson and, and, and what you're doing? So I'm on YouTube as well. It's just Mike Tyson Mushrooms. There's always an imposter on like every platform, <laughs> even on the one website, uh, dmtnexus.com. Somebody like created, they, they always take my face. I mean, I don't know if you deal with the same scammers and stuff, it's but like there's literally like a dozen a week sometimes. And it's like, it's crazy. So you got to find the one who's Mike Tyson Mushrooms with, with my logo and, and my, my beautiful face. Um, but yeah, I have a growing YouTube channel. I'm on Patreon as well, which helps to support the, the YouTube channel. Uh, I, I, I'm the worst at doing too many things at once and trying to do them all myself. So like as, as a business owner, it's like the worst, worst possible situation or, or circumstance to have is like be really good at almost anything you try or marginally good, but then also have a lot of work to do. And so you try to do everything yourself. It doesn't work. And that's one of the things I learned from Peter Oy was outsource, outsource where you can, but I still don't outsource my video editing. I, I tried, it doesn't feel good. So I have to do it, but then it takes me forever. So like my videos aren't flashy or anything, but uh, if you like my energy and, and you want to learn more about mushrooms, uh, definitely check me out on YouTube. I have like 10 or 12 videos or so uh, on how to grow, different things to consider, stuff like that. Um, I'm hoping to grow up more. It's just I, I have so many ideas. And, and like one time I had six cameras set up and I tried taking this, this one video of this really basic concept for like making slants. And I turned it into this huge production and I tried recording it like three times and I was like, man, like this isn't working out. And I had to step back for it. It was like two or three months. And then I originally, and then I eventually did it. I did it with only three cameras and that worked out a lot better. 
but yeah, like I overcomplicate it, and I don't, I don't know. I, 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 I'm envious of the people who can just like record a video, edit it, make it real flashy in one day. I'm like, man, like you guys are really good at what you do, and I'm really good at mushrooms. I'm really good at growing mushrooms and getting people excited about mushrooms. But video editing isn't my strong suit, so I'm slacking on YouTube, but I'm working on it. Oh, well, I think uh, it's awesome because it's the content that counts, right? And I think, uh, you know, people get a lot of value out of it. So we will put all the links to all of that in the description below so you can avoid the scammers too because you're right. They're popping up everywhere. Yeah, everywhere. And, uh, it's, it's brutal. It uh, is. I, I don't know why. I think it's just the mushroom space. But, um, yeah, for all the people listening, neither myself nor Mike Tyson nor probably any of the mushroom people will reach out to you or DM you and try to sell you mushrooms. No, like, yeah, that's We're the thing. Like, do that, I've had so. a guy reach out to me and be like, hey, bro, you owe me 700 bucks. And I'm like, for what, dude? Like, no, I don't know you. He's like, well, you, I sent your, I sent this money to your buddy, your partner. And I was like, I don't have any partners. I don't, have, I don't know who you're talking about, my buddy. And he sent me a Facebook picture, like of a screenshot of a profile that he sent money to. And I'm like, that's your fault for sending money to a stranger. It sounded like a scam within a scam. It was like, like it wasn't original. Like he never got, I don't know. I, I felt like it was a scam in itself, you know, of, of him trying to get me. Oh, you think he was reverse scamming? Yeah. <laughs> you never know, <laughs> man. Inception. You never know. And, and it's yeah. crazy, like the scam space. And so like just today I had two people reach out to me and like, do you have another profile without the S on it? I'm like, no, it's a scammer. <laughs> like, can you look at the pictures and see? But the worst thing is that is when they use my, my, my daughter's face. Like I don't care to use my face, but yeah. then they take my daughter's face and I'm like, man like and they always do because they're like oh nobody will suspect uh this 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 cute innocent little girl of of being like a scammer and i'm like but how how messed up in the head do you have to be i don't know that that's the one so like now we don't post any family stuff anymore which sucks because i love the family content like reading mushroom books and doing stuff in the lab and involve the family and in, in almost everything i do and and like it sucks because i can't share that stuff and that's the stuff that i think will inspire other people to bring it in the family a little bit more and not, you know, keep it internalized and, and, and share the knowledge and, and like what's, mm -hmm. what's better than sharing the knowledge of what, what gets you excited with the kids. Right. And so for me, it sucks because I want to post more of that content, but I don't know where, uh, you know, I could post it on YouTube, I guess, where there's not as much, uh, noise and, and it's not as easy to, to scam people, but even still it's frustrating and I know you get it. Yep. Uh, but I also get how, how hard you're working and how much you're doing to the space. So everyone in the, in the, in the, in the mushroom space is super supportive and appreciative of everything that you do. So yeah, I uh, just want to see you keep on crushing it. And, uh, thank you so much for joining us on the mushroom show. Is there anything else that we didn't talk about that you want to, you want to get across? No, nah, man, I think we, we nailed it. Check out Josephine. You definitely want to include a link to Josephine on, on her Instagram. She's got all of her donation links. You know, that's really what uh, I'm most excited about sharing is is the work that she's doing. But uh, other than that, man, I just wanna I wanna get that closer from you. All right, and uh, I want you to send me some of your lines, mate, because I haven't tried it. Uh, honestly, I, I really feel bad for not having tried your stuff yet. But I want to try yours, and then I'll send you some of mine. We can share, and uh, you know, I think it'd be cool to have you take, try mine out and, and see see how you like it, because yeah. uh, you know, from brand to brand, the yep. the effects can be different as you know um, For sure. and uh, i just i'd be interested to see what you what you've got love it yeah let's collaborate on that well um and again for anyone watching this or listening we'll put all the links in the description so you can go check out that out but mike tyson thank you so much for joining us on the mushroom show really appreciate it hey tony thanks for having me man awesome take care